Good afternoon to all of you. So welcome to today's uh, early session of our uh, interactive uh, meetings. So as we often do that, we engage in some kind of like a, a random revision, random in the sense we use some of the uh, past as uh, a starter to create the opportunity for uh, you know, discussion. Yeah, so, and I also tell you that I'm not so much interested in uh, answers to particular question. Well, in any case, we could just uh, provide the answers to the questions or as some people have put together the solve questions of the entrance examination and the uh, uh, making available to students. So that is not the point. I want to use the question just to create a discussion and explain so many other things related to that to you. So that is the perspective uh, from which I would like us to discuss the 2019 entrance examination. And if you look at the, the, you know, the session B, the session B, uh, the written component, it's teaching to students to, again, to do two things. Uh, one, in relation to writing a memo to a World Bank group, uh, making suggestions concerning the law reform, especially with sources of law. Uh, so that one is there. Now, that question, although it has come before, uh, let me just uh, quickly uh, go there before we come back to uh, this particular, I just want to draw your attention to something. Uh, that is the, uh, yeah. So if you look at the session B of 2009, I think the question was uh, asking you to uh, provide uh, a write-up on the sources of law and it's supposed to be with the context of the, you know, the Law Reform Commission. Yeah, now because of the recent Supreme Court case, uh, the recent Supreme Court case uh, involving like the, the Bank of Ghana, right? Involving the Bank of Ghana, uh, I think that uh, it is a question which is so topical especially with respect to subsidiary legislation. And uh, just in case you're not uh, aware, I'm referring to the case of uh, association of, right? Association of finance uh, against Bank of Ghana and Attorney General. I'll put it on the platform in which uh, some of you have a platform and you know what I am talking about because uh, in the association of finance against the Bank of Ghana, I think the, it brought up the issue of uh, subsidiary legislation. You know, like the Bank of Ghana, as part of their uh, supervisory uh, uh, powers, they, from time to time, issued a directive. And a uh, question has arisen as whether the directives that the Bank of Ghana they issue is supposed to, for example, uh, be subsumed under Article 11, Clause 7. So if you look at Article 11, Clause 7, uh, any orders, rules, or regulation that is subsidiary legislation, legislation, so to speak, uh, which are made, are supposed to be laid before Parliament. And then on the day that it is laid, it's also supposed to be uh, gazetted. So if uh, that is the case, uh, Bank of Ghana, uh, the directives that they issue and all that shouldn't be also be understood as a, a form of uh, uh, delegated legislation. And if it is so, uh, shouldn't it comply with the format for making uh, delegated legislation. So I'd like you to read uh, that case, just 25 feet. I put it on the on the platform. Uh, those of you who are there, the various WhatsApp platform, uh, you can just uh, read that. And that is the only reason for exciting my interest as far as uh, the question which came in 2009 is concerned. Because uh, as to whether the 
Article 11, uh, Clause 7. Of course, of course, quite apart from the, in the, the Association of Finance and Bank of Ghana, an issue wants to arise as whether the Article 11, Clause 7 itself is not problematic. Like the fact that uh, when uh, a subsidiary legislation or a delegated legislation is laid before parliament, uh, certainly a reference will be made to the particular uh, parliamentary committee, which is like the committee on subsidiary legislation. But if you look at 11 or 7, uh, parliament cannot change even a sentence or whatever. All that you have to do probably is to make like a suggestion and then those who laid it may probably just uh, withdraw it and then uh, go and do certain things about it and bring it and all that. So that is uh, just a uh, one problem. So in addition to that, I would like you to also read the recent thinking of the Supreme Court uh, with respect to the power of the Bank of Ghana to issue directives and all that as well. Uh, uh, it must uh, be treated as a subsidiary legislation. That was just uh, by the way. But of course, for the second, the second question, which is about the contract for sale in Ghana, because commercial law has been taken from the examinable areas, uh, I think that uh, we don't have to uh, worry ourselves about that. Except where maybe you wanted to broaden that question to just the, the principle of the formation of contract in Ghana. In general, if it's a, like a general question, like you are asked to do presentation on the principle of formation of contract in Ghana, uh, then you will need to uh, tell us uh, that we have uh, two types of like the contract. We have like the formal contract, that is a, a contract by date or contract under seal. And then we also have what we call like the, the simple contract that is like the parallel contract. And you know very well that the a formal contract uh, is supposed to have all the formalities. It must be in writing, must have the signature and seal of the parties and all that. That is fine. So that one is uh, pretty straightforward. And uh, depending upon the type of contract that it is, if it relates to land, then it will have to comply with the Land uh, Act 2020. Uh, if it does not relate to land and it's just like an ordinary uh, contract, uh, then uh, that would be it. So you finish with that. Then you come to uh, simple or parole contract. Then you make the point that for simple or parole contract, uh, all the elements that we know, there must be evidence that somebody has made an offer, another person has accepted. And then those who are entering the party too must also have like the requisite capacity as well. They should not be infant. They should not be uh, suffering from the mental derangement or they should not be uh, intoxicated and all that, and as you know. And then uh, there's uh, intention to create legal relations, we know that, and there should be genuineness of uh, consent. That is to say that uh, nobody's content, consent should have been extracted as a result of uh, you know, the initiating factors, mistake, misrepresentation, the rest on the influence. And of course, legality. The contract they are making must also be lawful, it must not be contrary to public policy. And finally, there must be certainty of terms. The party should be clear as to what exactly they've agreed upon. So these are the points, for example, you could canvas for that type of question, but I doubt as to whether there will be any question of their sort. But because they brought uh, a similar question with respect to general principles for formation of a, a contract of sale, that is why just out of abundance of question, or as Abudanjia Cortella, I have deem it appropriate to try and extrapolate and, and, and put it in a, 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 a broader context. And, and that is what, but having, we now come back to what you want to discuss. So let's start from uh, question one. And as I said, these are supposed to provide uh, triggers or prompters for us to have uh, discussion. So one, uh, which of the following defines constitutionalism? So before we look at the options, we have discussed this, uh, uh, virtual interactive uh, class. Uh, the, since the last uh, five, uh, since the, fa the last five six or six weeks that, uh, girlfriend, I'm teaching online. Good afternoon. I'm teaching online, so let me call you afterwards, right? right. We've been doing this uh, for the past uh, five uh, to six weeks that when you talk about constitutionalism, it simply means the idea or the concept in constitutional law that there should be restraint, but there should be limitation on powers of government so that 
we can safeguard the liberty of the citizen, the government. And as we know, that absolute uh, power comes absolutely. Uh, as uh, Montesco and JJ Boudin and all that. And we've talked about the fact that constitutionalism can be procedural constitutionalism, that is procedural limitation. The fact that you are, com you are, you are conferred or power, but you must exercise it according to a certain procedure. And if you don't do that, despite the fact that you have been uh, clothed with the, uh, with, with the power as it were, it will not be a valid exercise of your power. So that is procedural. And then you also talk about the fact that constitutionalism may be substantive. Substantive in the sense that you have expressly be denied a certain power or certain power has been vested only in, or, you know, certain powers have been given, certain power have been taken away. And you cannot do anything about that. For example, uh, parliament has the power to make a law, but there's an express provision that parliament shall not make a power, turning Ghana into a one party state. So despite the fact that legislative power is vested in parliament, that legislative power under no circumstances and by no stretch of imagination can it be exercised so as to turn Ghana into one party, state, uh, one party state, so to speak. So that is, if you like, an example of like the substantive uh, 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 constitutionalism. And then we also talk about institutional uh, constitutionalism. Institutional uh, constitutionalism is uh, a manifestation of what we call like the checks and balances. The fact that uh, certain powers are be given to certain institutions or certain powers cannot be exercised without collaboration with some other institutions and all that. For example, parliament has the power to make a law, but parliament cannot get an act of parliament. The executive will have to come in. The president will have to assent and all that. And the president has also been given the power to veto legislation, but that power uh, also will have to be in conjunction with the Council of State Asset. So these are some of the examples of constitutionalism. So aware of this general explanation, let's look at the question again. Which of the following defines constitutionalism? A, government, if you know the answer, I can just put it in the, in the chat so that when we, we, you can check whether government action should be based on the constitution, government action should be legal, government action should be controlled, Government action should be legal and constitutional. Okay, let's. So, what is your take? Let's look at your responses. Uh, okay, we have uh, we have A, B, C. D. Some are saying A, some are saying C. Okay, so those who are, uh, let's start and then let's start. We're, and as I say, anytime we're doing a multiple choice, we have to use the elimination uh, method. Let's use the elimination method to get the correct answer. Government actions should be based on the constitution. Uh, that is true, but that will just give you constitutional government and not constitutionalism. Constitutionalism requires that there's a certain ethos, there's a certain conviction among the body politic, the citizen with that. There's a need to put restraint on those who have political power. So A is not the best uh, answer. So we are not going to, so we cross out A, let's go to B. Government action should be legal. That is not different from A. Because if you say that government action should be based on the constitution, that is true. It's also about legality. So A and B are essentially the same, if you understand what we are talking about. A and B are essentially the same. And for that matter, A and B cannot be the correct answer. You have to cross them out. Uh, let's go to C. Government action control. We've already explained constitutionalism to mean that there should be restraints on governmental power or exercise of governmental power. So that should ring a bell. That C is likely to be the correct answer. But let us validate that by testing it against the other remaining option, which is D. Government action should be legal and constitutional. Now, what the examiner has done is to marry A and B. And once we have concluded that A is not correct, because if government action is based on the constitution, all that we have is the constitutional government. And having constitutional government does not automatically translate into constitutionalism. So 
uh, A is out and government action should be legal also is the same as uh, A. It, in, in a sense, the same. So since A is out, B is also out. And since D is the combination of A and B, then certainly D cannot be the answer. So the correct answer, uh, C. So government action should be controlled. So you see how uh, the elimination method can help you to get the correct answer. So do, those who chose the C, uh, in my view, are the, those who made like the right uh, option. So those who chose uh, A, B, and D, I would like any of you to explain your choice of the answer. So uh, put up your hand and then we we'll allow you to speak. Or let me do it this way. I'm going to, you can unmute yourself, but as soon as uh, you finish talking, you have to mute yourself back so that we don't get the, the, the noise from your background, okay? Yeah, so you can unmute yourself if you want to speak, but only one person at a time. Those who chose A, B, and D, can you explain your answer for us? Barista. <laughs> Good afternoon, Doug. Barista, I may make you my class with it. You are regular in this class. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. I chose the C, so I think uh, I don't belong to <laughs> that category of people who have to explain. All right. Um, All right. So those who chose the A, uh, B, and D, I'm interested in uh, your explanation so that we can all learn from what you have in mind. It doesn't matter. I mean, there's nothing wrong. Just, we just want to... Yes, uh, Cecilia. Cecilia, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, good evening, dog. Yeah, good evening, Cecilia. Good evening, dog. Good evening, Cecilia. Okay, uh, it was a mistake. Huh? Yes, it was a mistake, but I, 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 I think the answer is C. It was just a mistake. So you could see that I've, I've corrected it by um, choosing C again. Right, right, right. No problem. Okay. Hello. Yes, yeah, Cecilia, okay. that's fine. Thank you. That's well noted. Okay. Uh, the other people, will anybody mm -hmm. uh, explain or you are all convinced that uh, C is the answer in the light of the discussion that we have done? Yes. All right. Okay. Okay. So let's look at the uh, question two. Uh, but just before uh, we look at question two, uh, still on A, I have used two concepts. We have constitutionalism and we have constitutional government. Uh, constitutionalism involves constitutional government, but constitutional government alone does not give you constitutionalism. So that is one thing that we should note. Because if you look at even like the military regimes and all that, they come out with proclamation, right? Uh, and they put in place some kind of agreement. So in a sense, you would say that uh, uh, they are trying to uh, follow uh, legality or lawfulness. Or if you go back to the Nazi regime before the Second World War, the, the, the fourth which in the German, the government was based on law, constitutional arrangement, and order. Nevertheless, we cannot say that constitutionalism was uh, at work. Go to Libya too. During Muammar Gaddafi time, they have constitution, they have law and order, but you cannot say that we had the constitutionalism. Yeah, so let's keep that in mind. So let's go up to question two. Arranging in chronological order, the following uh, steps in exercising legislative power. Uh, so we have to uh, remember Article 106. We have to remember uh, Article 106 of the 1992 Constitution, which provides what we call the framework or the mode of exercising uh, legislative uh, power. So that is the Article 106 and. Of course, together with the relevant standing orders of uh, parliament, we have to be uh, familiar with it. So if nothing at all, we have to remember that according to Article 106 of the Constitution, uh, the power of parliament to make laws shall be exercised by bills passed by parliament and assented to by the president. And so Article 106, Clause 1, 
for example, if we give you example of the what we we're talking about earlier on regarding the constitutionalism, look at it. The power to make laws is vested in who? Parliament. So that example of a substantive constitutionalism. And then it shall be exercised by parliament uh, by passing a bill. So that is procedural constitutionalism, isn't it? You have to do it in a particular procedure. You have the power to make law, but a certain procedure. And ascended to by president, that is institutional constitutionalism. The legislative power, but we see like the different uh, institutions uh, coming to play. But let's uh, move on. That, that was just like a footnote uh, remark. Uh, our interest lies in the procedures for uh, making, uh, making a bill, like passing, uh, passing a bill into an act of parliament. Let's see, I'm teaching online. I'm teaching online, I'll call you afterwards. Yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, clause two, uh, no bill other than such a bill as is referred to in paragraph A of article 108 of the constitution shall be introduced in parliament. Okay, uh, in other words, apart from uh, a bill which is introduced under what we call the certificate of emergency, right? If you go to article uh, one, uh, no, oh, no, of course not the, uh, article 108, a bill relating to uh, financial uh, matters. Uh, it is only the president at whose instance such a bill can be introduced in parliament. Now, quite apart from that, uh, any bill must be accompanied by explanatory memorandum telling us the detail of the policy underlying it, the defects in the existing law justification and all that and so on. It should be published in the Gazette 14 days before it is introduced in Parliament. And then if it affects chief tenancy, the referral must be made to the National House of Chiefs uh, before it will be introduced in Parliament. And uh, again, uh, when the bill is read the first time, the bill being read first time means that uh, it's officially announced on the floor of Parliament for the first time. Uh, after that, a referral will have to be made to the appropriate uh, committee. And if you go to Parliament, they have various standing committees. That is a permanent uh, committees on different uh, subject matters or thematic areas. And usually the standing committees in Parliament mirror the portfolio that we have in government. So that just as in government, we have, let's say, finance, uh, we have sports, we have defense, uh, justice, interior, and all that. If you go to parliament, we have uh, standing committees, which mirrors those uh, uh, various uh, committees uh, as, uh, as, as, as it was. So that is how a parliament is. Hello? I'm very well. I'm teaching online. I'll call you later. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, after the first reading, the FERA will have to be made to the appropriate uh, committee. So that let's say that if uh, it affects, let's say, the police. It will be referred to the parliamentary committee on maybe like the defense and interior or something like that, and so on and so forth. So uh, after the, and it is in the committee in which a detailed consideration will be given. And then you come and advise to parliament, that is a plenary uh, 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 body. Sorry. Yeah, so the appropriate committee will make uh, uh, um, the bill, and after they are done with the examination, and then they have put their report before Parliament. Hello, Doc. Parliament, yes. Yeah, yeah. Who wants to talk? Yeah. So Parliament will then. Hello, Doc. Yes. Uh, mention it. Hello, Hello, Doc. Please, it seems the, the feedback from the other users is interrupted. If you can please mute all of us. Oh, okay. So let me mute all of you. If you want to talk, then you raise up your hand. Okay. 
Let me check if I'm okay. Okay, so I think it's better now. Okay, so after the particular standing committee has given the thorough consideration to the bill, they will make their report available to the full house. And then the full house will then have to uh, uh, debate uh, the bill on basis of the report. And after that, they will have to uh, vote as to whether they are approving the bill for it to become an act of parliament or they are not. And when the bill has eventually been passed by parliament, it will be referred to the president for his signature, that is for his assent. And this must take place within seven days after the referral. And if uh, he doesn't want to uh, assent to it or he's between the refusing to, to assent, uh, he will have to uh, indicate that. And, uh, or he can also make a referral to the Council of State and ask for advice and so on and so forth. So uh, in a nutshell, this is like uh, how uh, bills uh, are made. So let us uh, uh, look at uh, the question again. Arrange in chronological order the following steps in exercising legislative power. I, referral to appropriate committee to examine the bill, read and make all necessary inquiries. I, I, full debates on the bill by parliament. I, 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 reports of the committee. I, V, presentation of bill to the president for us. So if you remember what we just discussed with reference to, uh, Article 1 says you have to know that definitely the in terms of the options that we have, the, they'll have to be like the referral to the committee to examine before the report to the committee is submitted. And then a full debate is done by parliament on the basis of the report. And finally, there's a presentation to president first. And so the order will be uh, I. I, 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 V. So I, 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 uh, I, I, and I, V. Yes, yeah, so uh, dancer will be C. Let me see if anybody chose any other dancer. Then we invite the person to explain. Who is not uh, convinced that the answer is C? You can let us know, then we'll listen to your explanation before we move on. Anybody? I don't want you to keep quiet because I have uh, stated that a particular option is the answer. We're interested in understanding. You may have something else in mind, and I'll be interested in uh, learning from your point of view. And then if you are wrong, I can comment uh, on what you're doing. Yes. Uh, Saint. Mugai, Saints. Yes, yeah, we, we, we are not talking because per the prelude you give in terms of Parliament's mode of exercising their power. Yes. Uh, President to assent before the report of the committee. Yes. So, so we, we chose C to confirm what you told us before even going on to choose the C. That's what yes. we are talking. Yes, that is true. And, and I think that, uh, Hello. yeah, I can hear you. Saint, I can hear you very well, yeah. Uh -huh. So th that's the reason why we are not talking because you, you gave a brief before getting to the yes. question. All so right. you made us understand how the legislative processes are taking to uh -huh. So. Uh, that's why we are not talking. All right. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Uh, so, 
question three, we come back to the law of contract. Uh, until it says that, hey, I don't have my report here, otherwise, uh, Okay, that's fine. Okay, see. Okay, so the case of humans against coffee. Uh, 1987, one Ghana law report, 144 can be used as authority for which one of the following? Uh, remember humans and coffee. When we were having uh, those of you who took part in my law of contract class with the first year students, of course, the recording is also available on YouTube. Uh, are they on the duress and on the influence? I talk about the case of humans and coffee, uh, where a man uh, was a, a building, a small building contractor, you go and get uh, goods on credit, like building materials on credit. And it got to a point that uh, he was owing so many people that uh, some of them uh, got the police to arrest him. They couldn't get him. So they initially uh, got the, the son. So when they got the son, I think they kept the son for two or three days. And eventually the father himself uh, suffers. And then when the father suffers then, they did the exchange. They released the son and rather detained the, the father. And having detained the father for quite some time, they prevailed upon him to agree the house to be sold so that they could raise money to pay uh, the people that he was owing. So he agreed for the house to be sold. And the police were quite instrumental in securing all these arrangements. So having uh, gotten a buyer, uh, he was released and the monies were used to pay off the creditors. Whatever was left was given to him. Then he quickly uh, got lawyers. And when he got uh, lawyers, he made them uh, seal to have the entire sale of his house uh, uh, set aside because uh, uh, he was the view uh, that the sale was not as a result of his free consent and it's as a result of uh, the rest uh, and all that. Now, when the matter eventually uh, traveled through the court processes right up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court agreed that uh, the contract was vitiated by uh, duress, despite the fact that the duress was by a third party. It could still vitiate the, the, the contract. And if you look at the, 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 the head note three, uh, the point was made that, quote, where the duress was by a third party and not the other contracting party, it must be established that the other contracting party who was seeking to enforce the contract knew at the time of making the contract of the threats or the compulsion or the constraint of the party pleading, uh, uh, pleading the rest. On the first of the instant case, knowledge of the circumstances and plight of the plaintiff before and at the time of the sale to be imputed to the first defendant. In other words, the court was saying that it is possible for one to sustain uh, duress as having initiated a contract, even if the duress was uh, not by the parting party, by a third party. If the duress was by a third party, insofar, insofar as the contracting party who stood to benefit from the contractual arrangement, otherwise actuated by the duress. Uh, uh, please, uh, some of you, you have your mind still on and you are making noise. So just mute yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, that could still uh, be uh, upheld as a duress that uh, affects the, 
the contract. So we look at this case, for example. So the court said that uh, if we look at the circumstances of this case, uh, what uh, happened was that the, those who were buying the house or the one who bought the house knew very well that the owner and the vendor was not a free person, was uh, in detention and was owing people, which was the reason why he was in detention and all that. And for that matter, uh, the court said that he could have knowledge of the duress imputed or attributed to him. That's why the fact that the rest was from a third party. And the third party here was like the police because the police was not party to the sale of the house. Now, so aware of this understanding of Imans and Kofi, let us look at the question again. The case of Iman, so put your answers there before uh, you feed the answer. Put your answers there if you want. The case of Iman against Kofi can be used as authority for which one of the phone uh, positions? A. Where the duress was by a third party and not the other contracting party, it had to be established that the other contracting party who was seeking to enforce the contract knew at the time of making the contract of the threat or the compulsion or the constraint on the party pleading duress. Okay, so A uh, sounds very sweet in the light of what we have just uh, discussed. So we know. A appears to be like the great candidate at this stage. But let's uh, test that as whether A will be like the correct answer. Let's test that against the remaining three options. B, the purpose of a loan contract is neither the subject matter nor the fundamental obligation owed by the borrower to the lender. Uh, that is not the decision in Hemans and Kofi. That is a decision in another a popular case. Who can put that case there? And then uh, I can have a lunch or dinner with the person. Uh, B. B is the uh, 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 principle enunciated in another uh, Ghanaian case. Anybody? Let me see. Oh, great. Barista, you're actually in the top form. Barclays Bank and, and Secretary. Okay. That is true. Barclays Bank and Zachary, uh, about the Sawala track. Uh, you know, someone had taken a loan at the Barclays Bank to buy a Sawala track, having purchased it. Uh, at the point in time, the government uh, had a policy that it is only a uh, state institution to use the Sawala track. And what that meant was that uh, it was illegal to continue to use the Sawala track and all that. And this person defaulted in paying the, paying the loan. And when he was sued by the Barclays Bank, he put up the defense that the contract had been frustrated by changing government policy. Because the government policy had made it illegal for a private person or company to be using the solar track. And the court said that when you have like the, a loan agreement, the primary obligation is for you to pay the loan and not uh, what you use the loan for, and so on and so forth. So that is the point about B, that the purpose of a loan contract is neither the subject matter nor the fundamental obligation owed by the borrower to the lender, but to pay the loan given. Yeah, so thank you, Barista. Barclays Guns against uh, uh, Zachary. Uh, C, the position of William and Rofi uh, brothers only applies where there is a deep variation. Of course, if you know Williams and Rafael brothers, uh, it will not even come to your mind as any one of the near answers. So that is beside the point. Because Williams and Rafael brothers, if you remember, is one of the uh, relatively uh, modern exception developed to the principle in Silk and uh, Marek. Uh, you know, Silk and Marek uh, said that where you have a contractual obligation and you perform that contractual obligation, it cannot be a valid uh, consideration for a fresh promise and all that. And uh, Williams and Ruffin brothers came to say that uh, where you have performed a contractual obligation, 
but that had actually conferred some benefits to the other party, or that has saved the other party from some uh, detriment and all that, then that can be a, val a, a valuable consideration to support a fresh promise. That's why the fact that it was an existing contractual obligation that uh, you owe. But of course, we know that in Ghana, because of section eight, subsection two of the contract at 1960 at 25, uh, which has also uh, repealed the principle in folks and beer, the penal case mm -hmm. and all that, it actually makes unnecessary the principle in Williams against the Ruffle brothers. So let us keep that uh, in mind. So C is not the answer. D is not the answer. So let's look at uh, uh, D. So now we are left with A and D. A contract which results from duress must be to the manifest disadvantage of the person who is persuaded to enter into it. Uh, no, that is not the principle in Hermans and Kofi. That is not the principle. And in any case, uh, the manifest disadvantage of the person who persuaded to enter into it it's not really about, uh, if you like, like the duress. You could, for, for, for example, talk about some aspects of like the uh, undue, uh, if you like, the influence. If you're talking about the situation of like presume and undue influence type of thing. Or if you're talking about the doctrine of unconscionability. So the answer uh, of the question, the case of Herman and Kofi can be used as authority for each other for business is A. That is where the duress was by a third party and not the other contracting party. It had to be established that the other contracting party who was seeking to enforce knew at the time of making the contract of the threats or the compulsion or the constraint on the party pleading uh, duress. So let me look at what we have for you at this time. Uh, Alaji. Yeah, so it's been uh, recorded. Uh, Jennifer, okay, Jennifer A, okay, I think, uh, yeah, okay, that is fine. And then all of you got it correct. Okay, so let's look at uh, four. Uh, this evening uh, or this afternoon session is going to be a very short one. So I think at the, just about, I'll continue to say so, so we'll be ending and then later on in the night, we'll continue. Uh, Graham, an antique dealer, collects and sells records. While visiting a local town, he noticed that Peter had, Pete, that Peter had rare editions of three books for sale in a second-hand bookshop. He negotiates and agrees to and agrees a price of 500 CDs for each of the rare edition on the assumption that you have the books in his possession. He negotiates to sell the first book to Eric for 800 uh, CDs. For 800 uh, CDs. The second hand book is to be sold to Ellen for six and Together with another rare book, that Ellen is to sell to Graham for 400 CDs. As Graham has a buyer, as Graham has a buyer for this book in the sum of six and CDs. The third book, which is the only surviving copy, is to be sold to Richard for the sum of 100,000 cities, no, 1,000 cities, sorry. Graham has now returned to collect and pay for the tributes from Peter as agreed. He is shocked as Peter informs him that the sale is off because he has received an offer from Bertram in the sum of 2,000 cities the set of three books and has agreed to sell them to him. Which one of the remedies below has Graham against uh, 
Peter. Okay, so before we even come to the specifics of this question, I would like us to use uh, this story to also, this can also be, if you like, like the, a problem-based question. This can be an essay question or problem-based question as it were on its own. So let us apply Iraq to it. And I want you to attempt to state the area of law and the issues. So we can do that in the chat and then we look at it. So I'm giving you one minute, just try. Identify the issues and then uh, an area of law and the issues, okay? Just uh, put that in the chat. Okay, so let me look at uh, what you have done. Uh, let's start from the top. Uh, let's start from the top. Okay, so a queer said era of law. A queer has not uh, told us what it is. For Stabuatin, era of law is contract, breach of a contract, remedies for breach of contract. Mm. Okay, uh, iPhone, area of law is law of contract, specifically remedies for breach of contract. Uh, let's take another person. Okay, uh, Jacob, equitable remedy of specific performance. Is that, no, I didn't say tell us that, I said, uh, Let's assume you have this uh, narration, right? As a, a problem-based question. And we're trying to work, the, work out the area from the issues. Uh, Josephine, the law of contract era with specific reference to whatever remedies. Uh, okay, let's move on. A queer contract law with specific reference to offering acceptance and remedies for breach of contract. Uh, okay, remedies for breach of contract, as area of law, barrister, area of law, contract law, that means for breach of contract issues. And so I'm expecting him to raise the issue, so he has raised the issues, whether or not by refusing to sell the books to Graham paid agreement, Peter is liable for breach of contract between him and Graham. And two, uh, what remedies, if any, available to Graham, okay? As for uh, Iman Zaika, area of law is contract, in reference to offering acceptance and breach of contract. Just for now, this an issue. Whether or not Peter has breached the contract with Graham. Barrister, okay, Barrister again. Uh, for Stabuatin issues, whether or not 
there's a contract between Graham and Peter. Whether or not Peter breached the agreement between himself and Graham. Whether or not Graham has any remedy. Yeah, so I think the first of all, uh, I like the fact that you are building upon what the uh, Atten Barista actually put down, Dr. Himfo. Yeah, I'm, teach I'm teaching online. Yeah, yeah, just busy. All right, so later, bye. All right. Oh, yeah, so. Uh, so Deborah Jesse, uh, a breach of contract. Yeah, so I was making the point that I like the first button because uh, we need to find out whether there's an agreement before we proceed to say that there has been a breach of the agreement, even if you are not going to waste time in demonstrating existence of agreement. You can just dismiss it in a few sentences, so that is fine, before we move on to explore whether there has been a breach of that agreement and then uh, what remedies uh, are available. Yeah, so I think that, okay, so uh, I think some of you have made a, a very useful contribution. Okay, so let's uh, work together. Uh, let's try and we are all, uh, you know, we have a consensus or we reach a common understanding that the bigger area of law is a uh, law of contracts. And then uh, some of you have also raised that uh, it's about uh, agreement to offer an acceptance and a breach of contract and then the remedies for the breach. Okay, they are all correct. So let's look at the issues. Uh, let's go through the sentence one after the other and then for each of them, they raise the issue. Graham, Antique de la Colette, and Sears Rare Books. Is there any issue? No, there's no issue. So while visiting local time, he noticed that Peter had rare edition of three books for sale in his second-hand book, bookshop. Uh, so Peter uh, has three books for sale in his second bookshop. Uh, does it provoke any issue? Not directly, so let's move on. He negotiates and agrees a price of 500 CDs for each of the rare edition on assumption that you have the books in his possession. He negotiate to sell the first book to Eric for 800 CDs. So, so you look at that sentence. We have uh, two things there. So the first part uh, relates to whether there's a, an agreement or whether there's even like a, a offer and acceptance. There's an agreement uh, between uh, Graham and, uh, and and Peter, right? That is like the first part of the sentence. And then the next one, he negotiates to sell the first book to Eric for 800 cities. Is there any issue? Negotiate to sell. Uh, no, that doesn't necessarily provoke any issue at this stage. The second hand book is to be sold to Ellen for 600 cities. Together with another rare book, that Ellen is to sell to uh, Graham for 400 CDs. As Graham has a buyer for this book in the sum of 600 CDs. Is there any issue uh, around it? Uh, not necessarily, let's move on. The third book, which is the only surviving copy, is to be sold to Richard for the sum of 1,000 cities. Graham has now returned to collect and pay for the three books from uh, Peter uh, as agreed. Uh, so I mean, that will feed into the issue that we raise as whether there's an agreement between uh, you know, Peter and Graham, or Graham and Peter. Now, he is shocked, that is Graham is shocked as Peter informs him that the sale is off because he has received an offer from Bertram in the same of 2000 cities for the set of three books and has agreed to sell them to him. So uh, that is the, the second issue as whether 
uh, uh, Peter has breached the contract or the agreement that uh, he has with Graham. And the, the third one, uh, that is the, the remedies bit. Okay, so now we have, if you like, like the three main uh, issues. So uh, let's suppose that uh, you have to treat them. As I keep telling you, take uh, one issue after the other. So you take the first issue, you make it like a topic, right? You underline it bold, and underneath you outline the principles. You outline the principles. So as far as uh, so the first issue is whether there's agreement or between uh, Peter and uh, Graham. The principles you tell us that yes, uh, usually uh, contract is uh, 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 by deed or simple or parole. Uh, a contract by deed uh, requires signature in view of the parties, and it does not need consideration to be by, uh, no, for it to be enforceable. But in this particular case, there's nothing to show that there's a contract under deed, so that is not applicable. But it's not relevant here. Now, a simple contract needs to have uh, an agreement. An agreement is often analyzed by trying to find out whether there's an offer and whether there's an acceptance. So uh, you tell us what an offer is, expression of willingness on the part of someone to contract and so on the inside authority. Uh, you tell us what acceptance is, on all qualified approval or endorsement or assent to the uh, terms contained in the proposal or the offer. Then you give us like the authority, right? Hide and reach and so on and so forth. And then you come on to make the point that by having regard to the circumstances of this case, uh, you, do, I mean, you are doing the application now. With respect to like the, the application, we can take for granted that uh, the question tells us that uh, they have agreed. So presumably, there's an agreement between uh, Peter and Graham, and there's no room for dispute regarding uh, the, that agreement. So it needs not detain our attention here. And you have just demonstrated to the examiner that yes, you are very much aware that it's important to find out that there's an agreement. But since in the circumstances of this case, the, it's quite obvious that there's an agreement. There isn't much to discuss or explore as far as the requirements for agreements are concerned. So then you leave that and then you come on to the next issue. Uh, you take the next issue as uh, the next topic, whether, uh, uh, what do you call it? Whether uh, Peter uh, is in breach or has breached the uh, agreement to sell the, uh, the tribals to uh, 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 Graham. Then you outline the principle. What are the principles for uh, breach of contract? That uh, a contract may be discharged by breach. That is where the parties are released from further performance of their obligation. There are uh, what do you call like the uh, for a breach to okay, which can repudiate the contract, what can release the parties from further performance, what can discharge the contract. It must be in respect of like the a condition. And a condition is a term which goes to the paramount importance or the root or the foundation of the contract. And for that matter, the breach of it entitled the innocent party to rescind it and so on and so forth. As to whether uh, and then you also tell us uh, the fact that where, uh, yeah, somebody is making an annotation. Any point, you want to make any point, just raise up your hand and then I'll allow you to speak. Yes, uh, who want to speak? Let me see. Uh, who made annotation, you want to say anything? Okay. Okay, so uh, you come to 
uh, you, you, you go on with the statement of the principles and all that. Then after that, you do the application. You do the application. So has there been like the, a breach? Has there been a failure on Peter to honor any of his obligation under the contract? If you conclude that yes, uh, that will amount to a breach uh, by saying that uh, he is going to sell it to another person to better and know that, okay, so you've disposed of that. Now you come on to the next one. What remedy is uh, uh, available? But the breach in this particular case, if you look at it, he said that he's shocked. As Peter informed me that the sale is off because he has received an offer from Bethlehem the sum of 2,000 cities for the set of 300 we has agreed to sell them to him. Now, as it is now, we do not know whether he has actually done the sale. He's only hinting that he's agreed. So the breach in this particular case could be what we call anticipatory breach, right? Anticipatory breach is where you breach the, con the, 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 the contract for your obligation is right for performance or before time for uh, performing your obligation. Uh, so if you, you we look at that force, we can exploit that, but that, that is not the focus of this question, except that we are just trying to use the, the, the narrative as a opportunity for discussing uh, a problem-based uh, question as we have seen. Now we come to remedies. The question is, what is the appropriate remedy? Then you have to uh, tell us the principle quickly. What are the remedies for breach of contract? Uh, the usual remedies for breach of contract are uh, the common law remedy of our of, uh, damages and then the equitable remedies of specific performance and injunction. So these are the remedies for breach of contract. And you tell us briefly about uh, each of them. So you can start from the equitable remedies, like the common law remedies. Uh, Damages are monetary compensation awarded for a breach of a contract. The aim of awarding damages is not to punish, but to place the innocent party in the position that he or she can be as far as money can do it. The case of uh, Robinson and Harman and so on and so forth. And then you say that uh, damages may be liquidated or liquidated. Liquidated is where the parties have made a genuine breast of how much loss will be occasioned in the event of a breach. You cite uh, the case of a Dunlop automatic tie against like the, uh, what do you call the new motto and all that. Then you make the point that where the parties have not made any general pre estimate, then the courts will have to do the assessment and quantification of damages. And that is unliquidated damages. And the court is usually guided by the principle and handling basing of that. Uh, the court will allow damages to be recovered for uh, losses which arise naturally in the usual course of things from the breach of the contract. And, uh, but where there are special uh, losses, uh, which who have been contemplated by the parties because of the information which had been shared at the time of making the contract, that can also be recovered. Material, laundry, and human, and so on and so forth. Then we are done. Then we come to specific performance. Specific performance is an equitable remedy which will be decreed to compel a person to carry out his uh, contractual obligation. And that is governed by the Muslims or principles of uh, equity that it will be granted usually where the subject matter of the contract is rare, where uh, damages will be inadequate, uh, where there has not been any delay and so on and so forth. Uh, these are some of the instances which will govern the award of specific performance. An injunction uh, is also a equitable remedy by which a person is uh, uh, ordered to reverse a wrong that he has committed or by which a party is restrained from carrying out a wrong such as breaching his contractual obligation and so on and so forth. So these are uh, the principles and then you have to do the application. So having regard to the current uh, scenario, uh, which remedy is uh, the most appropriate remedy? So A, specific performance. B, injunction. Uh, no, what is this?
uh, B, injunction, C, rescission, D, restitution. Uh, can you indicate your answer, please? Uh, we have um, Cecilia Ayelo. She has gone in for A. Nokia has gone in for A. Specific performance. Okay, so let's do the, the, the analysis. Specific performance. We have said that by it, a person is ordered to carry out his contractual obligation. And when will it be uh, ordered? Where the subject matter of the contract is rare, rare in the sense that it's not available in this open market. So that if you have money, you can just go and get it and so on. So then that makes it like a, a very good candidate for award of a specific performance. So if you look at this particular case, we are told that we have a very useful information from the start that Graham is an antique dealer. He collects and sells rare books, meaning that books which are not just ordinarily available, right? So specific performance uh, appears to be like a good candidate, but let's move on and look at the rest. Injunction. Uh, if not the fact that we have indication that the books are rare and all that. Uh, injunction could have been a, a good answer, especially if you come to conclusion that the, the, what Peter is doing is like a threatening breach, anticipatory breach, and not a natural breach. Because injunction as a remedy for breach of contract would be most appropriate where the breach is anticipatory. I'm not talking about actual breach because actual breach, oftentimes injunction will not do. You need to get damages, right? But injunction is not very, uh, I think the good candidate having regard to the subject matter of the, of the, of the contract. And then uh, C, rescission. Of course, rescission is where you are setting aside the contract. And let me say that uh, rescission is not a remedy for breach of contract. Please listen to this carefully. Rescission is not a breach. It's not a remedy for breach of contract. Rescission is a remedy for where a contract is vitiated. You know, where a contract is vitiated, then rescission is a remedy. So either by mistake, misrepresentation, duress, undue influence, and so on and so forth the rescission is a remedy. Where there's a breach of contract, rescission is not like the remedy. Restitution, no, restitution is not the, the, the remedy here. Restitution per se is not a remedy in its own right, but restitution is a course of action. What course of action is that? Restitution means that, for example, you have a case of unjust enrichment, right? such as in a, a money had and received you no know, type of uh, uh, claims and all that, so that is restitution. So in that regard, those who opted for specific performance, I think they have like the right uh, answer uh, as it were. Uh, let's look at the, our last question and then I'll end the class, question five. So as I told you, it's not so much about the questions and answers is about the discussion around the questions and the issues. I mean, that is what is of interest to me. Otherwise, we just uh, send you the questions and send you the answers, but that is not the point. So I'm interested in the discussion that we're having. So in the light of what I have said so far, if anybody has uh, any addition or question, you can just uh, let me know before I move on to question five. And just raise up your hand and then I will allow you to speak. Uh, I think today you are not prepared to share your ideas with us. Okay, uh, okay, barrister. Okay, okay, let me, uh, Kuya, 
Bryce, let me hear Akuya first and then I'll come to you. Akuya. Yeah, hello, Doc. Yes. Um, please, I realized in my reading that mostly repudiation and recession are used interchangeably. I want to know the difference. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that is true. Uh, they are used uh, interchangeably uh, in practice, but because I have um, uh, Black's Law Dictionary around, and I always want us to benefit from uh, more knowledge from what is there. Before I give like the specific response, I would like to uh, read for you uh, what Black's Law Dictionary is saying on each of them. So I start from repudiation. Uh, repudiation. Okay, good. So uh, I have the ninth edition of Black Law Dictionary in my office, and I have the eleventh edition in my study room. So I have the ninth edition here. So page fourteen, uh, eighteen. Uh, let's start from repudiate, right? Repudiate, to reject or renounce a duty or obligation, especially to indicate an intention not to perform a contract or to divorce or disown one's wife, repudiate. Then let's look at repudiation. A person's refusal to accept a benefice a contracting party's words or actions that indicate an intention not to perform the contract in the future. So a contracting party's words or actions that indicate an intention not to perform the contract in the future. A, threat, a threatened breach of contracts. Then it also make a reference to a, a, a rescission. So, uh, that is what he's saying about rescission. Then let's quickly look at the what it says about the, 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 the rescission and then we will reach a conclusion. Rescission. Okay, so. Recession, okay. Page, what is it? My eyes, my eyes, Recession, see recession. Okay, that's the invalid spelling. That is why. So we usually spell recession as a R E C. If you look at the black law dictionary, there's another spelling R V S. So, so refer me to the recession. So let me go there. Good, so uh, recession, uh, page 1420, if you're looking there, if you're using the ninth edition, quote, a party's unilateral or making of a contract for a legally sufficient reason, a party's unilateral or making of a contract for a legally sufficient reason, that is recession, such as the other party's material breach or a judgment rescinding the contract, so rescission is generally available as a remedy or defense for a non-defaulting party and is accompanied by restitution of any partial performance. Thus, restoring the parties to their pre-contractual position. So uh, you are right, there is nothing wrong if you use the two uh, interchangeably, right? Except that repudiation can 
you know, usually like you say recession, recession will usually refer to where you are saying that you will not, uh, you will not continue the contract and you don't even think that the contract should even stand and the party should be taken to the position that they were before the contract was made. And this is uh, typically the case where there's you no know, any of the vegetating factors and so on. Then you are taking the parties back to the position that they were the pre-contractual position. And that is why it's saying that restitution should be possible. And in fact, if you look at the availability of the remedy of rescission for misrepresentation, mm -hmm. one of the points which is often canvas is that restitution in tengrum should be possible, meaning that before you can rescind a contract for let's say misrepresentation, it, it should be possible for you to take the parties to the pre-contractual position. So in that respect, it can also mean repudiation, except that for repudiation, it's not all the time that it means you are taking the parties to the pre-contractual position. Repudiation could simply uh, mean that, uh, I'm not saying that the contract should be treated as not the contract or the party should be taken to the pre-contractual position, but that I am not performing the contract because you have, for example, breached a fundamental term. You breach a condition, a major term of uh, fundamental importance. And I think that the contract has come to an end. So the contract having come to an end is different from saying that uh, the law did not consider the contract, for example, as something valid. And for that matter, uh, the parties should be treated as not having entered into contract. Now that will be a very good uh, 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 you know, explanation for rescission. So repudiation mean, can mean rescission, but repudiation can also mean something other than rescission as sometimes. Because I said that, if, for example, someone has breached a condition and that entitles you to repudiate, what it means is that we are saying that the contract has been discharged, right? But it is different if, for example, you have entered into a contract and you discover that uh, someone made a false representation. And because of the false representation, you want to set the contract aside. In setting the contract aside, what you are, you are trying to do is that you are trying to say that the contract should no longer be treated as valid, should no longer be treated as binding because, because of the, the, the false representation, it was, like a, uh, you know, it was like avoidable and now you want to avoid it. You want to rescind it. Yeah, so uh, in a certain sense, in a certain sense, you are, uh, in a certain sense, you are right to say that precision and repudiation can be used interchangeably. But as I said, uh, in another uh, narrow context, uh, repudiation may not necessarily mean recession at all times. Yeah, so that is what I can say for now. Okay. Uh, Barrister, your hand was up before I, yes. All right, thank you, Doc. Okay. Uh, still on the same question, I had a second thought. What if there was another option, uh, for example, E as damages, so that damages will also be part of the options. Uh, will it be safe to still go for the injunction or in this case, damages? Because what we learn is that the first principle- No, I think, we, we, I think we, we went for specific performance. We didn't go for injunction. Oh, oh sorry, but yeah. So I'm not trying to, Add up something. I was saying that if they had added, uh, if they had added damages as one of the options, I mean, all things being equal here, because what we learn is that the first principle is that when there is a, maybe a breach of contract, we first resort to damages insofar as damages can do. It is only when damages cannot do that yeah, we yeah. get to. Uh, when they, they are inadequate, that we resort to the other equitable remedies. So in this case, and yesterday we were having another issue that sometimes the question some, to some extent always try to give the subjective intention of the examiner. Because here yeah, the examiner has qualified the question with some keywords such as rare 
yeah. trying to draw our attention to the fact that he or she was speaking or trying to draw our attention to a particular remedy and then its requirement that is specific performance. Yes. So in this case, if there was damage, will we, will it be safe to leave damages and go for specific performance because the question contains some facts which are yes. directing us to one particular uh, area? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, insofar as we have information pointing us to the fact that the subject matter of the contract is not something which is common. Uh, I think that uh, even if damages was there as he, we still have to uh, uh, stick to specific performance because of the information we have, letting us know that what the contract is about is not something which is uh, readily available or something which you can just uh, use money to get it and so on. Yeah, so that is what I would say. Okay, let's take our concluding question for this session and then we'll end. Question five. Mensa appoints George to act as his agent for two weeks. George agrees to act without payment. Mensa instructs George to collect rent each Friday morning from his tenants and pay the and pay the and pay the, the rent into the bank next, I think it should be as a next door or next day, okay. Uh, if the second week, George collects the rent but fails to bank it, on the way home, he leaves it on the trotro and it is never recovered. Can Mensa uh, take action against George for breach of his agency uh, duties? Okay. Uh, Although, if you read uh, this, your mind will be that uh, it's about, it's an, of course, it's a commercial law and commercial law because there's an agency and uh, agency is part of commercial law and commercial law has been taken from your syllabus. I mean, not this, your syllabus, from the examinable area for purposes of uh, uh, law school entrance examination. So this question five, for example, is a, I feel like the a type of commercial law and specific, specifically uh, agency uh, uh, question uh, as it's where, but we can still, uh, let's still treat it as part of like a general uh, 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 law of contracts. Because let's remember that when we are dealing with the privity of contracts, there's a little bit of uh, agency there, isn't it? So can Mensa take action against Joy for breach of his agency duties? Or because you think, oh, of course, it's not going to be examined. So don't let me uh, bother you for us to discuss agency law. Okay, so we will end uh, this session here. And then later in the night, we do about an hour or one and a half hours. So have a very good evening. Mm.